I wonder if you've ever heard a sermon or read a Christian book that opened something like this. Is your spiritual vitality really what it should be? Is your faith only intellectual and not a vital part of your experience? Do you feel like the joy of Christ is something you only experience occasionally, perhaps in church on Sunday, like an oasis, but that the rest of the week, in fact the rest of your life, feels like a slog through a dry and dusty desert? Well, I feel like I've read quite a lot of books and heard quite a lot of sermons that have started just like this and promised to solve this age-old problem. But I can't remember any of them being especially satisfying. They were either kind of vague in what they asked you to do, to, to enjoy God, to grasp hold of the pleasures of God, to savour the beauty of God, in sort of ways that I, I found practically quite difficult to grasp hold of and actually do. Or else they did recommend some practical action to take, but it was sort of like a mystical technique that was supposed to bring intimacy with God. And I didn't like that, either theologically or practically. But the good news is that the Christian author I'm speaking with today has succeeded, I think, where others have failed. He's written a book that is both deeply biblical and warmly practical, and one that points to the solution to this age-old spiritual problem. But to find out who he is and what his book is and what that solution is, You'll have to stay tuned and listen to this episode of the Centre for Christian Living podcast. I'm Tony Payne and welcome to the Centre for Christian Living podcast. This is episode 22 coming to you from Moore College in Sydney, Australia. Our goal, as always, is to bring biblical ethics to everyday issues, and this is the final episode in which we're trying to do that this year through this podcast. We're already, of course, looking forward to 2019, and we have a number of plans underway and a bunch of new things for CCL in 2019. I'll tell you more about those in our first episode next year. But you should put our first event for 2019 into your diaries or calendars or whatever you call them. It's on Wednesday, February the 27th, here at Moore College at 7.30pm, and the topic is the elusive joy of Christian community. Uh, We love the idea of being in warm and connected Christian communities, uh, but if we're honest, the reality doesn't often live up to that expectation. And so in this event, we want to dig into what really is Christian community, and how can we experience its joys those joys that often seem to escape us. I'll be speaking on that evening as will Chase Kuhn here from the Moore College faculty. It's on February the 27th. And if you head over to ccl.more.edu.au, you can find details and you can register even now. But let's get to our guest for today's episode. A guest who's written a book that, certainly for me, is the best answer I've come across to the question that has launched so many sermons and books and Christian conferences. And that is, how do we capture the experiential joy of loving and knowing God? The book is called simply Enjoying God, and the author is Tim Chester. Um, I'm Tim Chester, and uh, I guess I kind of wear three hats. I'm uh, a pastor of a church in North Yorkshire in England. Uh, I'm on Crossland's, uh, I'm a faculty member of Crossland's uh, training, providing training in in ministry for those, uh, uh, training for ministry for people who are in ministry, and then uh, I'm a writer. It's about your most recent book that I mainly want to talk to you about, Tim, and I'm going to ask you the question that I think all authors like to be asked, I think, which is, what's your book about? Uh, Well, it's called Enjoying God, and uh, in a sense, that's what it's about. Uh, It's about how we can enjoy God, uh, but particularly, I think, how we can live in relationship with God. What does it mean to actually have a relationship with God in all the nitty-gritty of life? There were two things that uh, really kind of sparked it, and one of those was uh, a feeling that we were often... Uh, I think rightly, absolutely rightly, calling on people to enjoy God, find their joy in God. So, for example, somebody might be uh, a single person struggling with their singleness. And I think rightly, we tend to call them then to say, well, you should find joy in Christ. Uh, but I wanted to sort of tease out, really, what does that actually mean? What is it? Otherwise, you're just left with this kind of rather rhetorical, or you might be preaching on, to that end, and you end with this sort of rhetorical flourish where you call on the congregation to find joy in Christ, and they sort of get caught up with this. And But actually, what is it? 
what do they actually do then when they go home? What do they do on a Monday morning to actually put that into practice? How do you actually find joy in Christ? And so one of the things the book does is really tease out how the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are engaged with us as Christians, how they're involved in our lives, uh, not just in those sort of rather, uh, it, it, you know, when we gather as God's people and we sing his praises and we, we have that sort of, uh, we hear this stirring message and we feel that uh, emotional response and that's great. Uh, but what does it actually look like on a Monday morning? How in all the sort of uh, day-to-day business of life is God interacting with us and how can we respond so that this, so living in relationship with God, enjoying God becomes this uh, part of just the ordinary uh, stuff of our lives. That's a great aim for a book because certainly when I am encouraged, for example, to um, savour the pleasures and glory of God, I always, in a church, in a sermon or something like that, yeah, yeah. I always think that sounds great. And I've all, I have I sort of feel as if I'm doing that when I'm at church often and yeah, it's, everything's yeah. happening. But then savouring the pleasures of God's presence and his glory doesn't always feel like that on a Monday. As you say, the, like, a Wednesday morning is even worse than a Monday morning, in my well, view. Indeed. Yes, and so I sort of, in my mind, I was imagining somebody who was sort of going home from that kind of sermon or or they've had this sort of um, uh, conversation with a Christian friend and they've been exhausted exhorted in this way. And what do they do? They go home and sit in their chair and kind of screw up their face and think, okay, and now I'm going to enjoy God. It, 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 it's, it, I wanted to try and give some substance to that. Uh, that would just sort of help people as they're uh, living, walking with Christ in daily life. Two of the key things you say early in the book are that the Christian life is meant to be that kind of warmer, more engaged, intimate, relational communion with God. It's a life where there is meant to be joy and there is meant to be an increasing, growing knowledge of God which in itself I think is an encouragement, that it's not as if the Christian life is just a duty that we have to perform or a set of beliefs we have to assent to and a set of stuff we have to do. It's it's an engagement with God that's personal and ongoing. And it's hard to find the right words for this, isn't it? When you say it's experiential, in yes. a sense, everything is experiential. Boredom is experiential. Um, distance is experiential. It's a kind of experience and a kind of relationship in a way, isn't it? Yes, I think, yes. I mean, experiential is the kind of old-fashioned word, and I think maybe we should do something to recover that, because I think that does capture... Because I think the, the alternative is a sort of intellectual faith, where there is some, where, where, where we are taught some truths, and then we give our assent to them, and that's kind of part of what's going on in the process. But that's a rather barren view of what it means to be a Christian. And it's this idea that we are saved... We're not, we are not just saved from sin, from judgment, uh, but we're actually also saved for a relationship. And we find that pattern uh, all the way through the scriptures, both in what is taught, but also just in the experience of God's people. You know, particularly if you think of the book of Exodus, where they are saved from slavery, but then they come to Mount Sinai to have an encounter with God, to enter into a covenantal relationship with God. Uh, for me, the climax of the book of Exodus is actually Exodus 24, which is when having made the covenant, the blood has been um, uh, sprinkled on the people. Then Moses and Aaron and the elders of Israel go up onto the mountain, this mountain that previously has sort of been ring fenced and you mustn't, otherwise God might break out against you. They go up and, and the text says they eat and drink and uh, in the presence of God. So so they encounter this uh, terrifying holy God and uh, and yet because of the blood of the covenant they come and they eat and drink in his presence and then in a sense that experience gets kind of built into the fabric of their life as the uh, we then read all the instructions and get the description of the building of the tabernacle so here is God coming to live with his people and to have a relationship with them and that you know that's just one example that's just one picture of the fact that we are saved to enjoy a relationship with God. That is the great kind of goal and purpose of salvation. You use the word communion or, or community with God to talk about that kind of relationship. In a sense, I suppose, everybody in the world is in a relationship with God. Uh, he's the He's the ruler and judge of all. He's the creator of all. There, there is a relation between yes. every single person and God, and you can't avoid that in a sense. But the kind of relationship that you were saying we can and should 
uh, enjoy with God is is a particular kind of communion. And what what do you mean by communion, or what does communion mean? Uh, I think it is it it is. The, I think the key thing about communion is a two way relationship. Um, and I mean, as you say, obviously, it's, there's a sense in which even the relationship of as creator or judge is two way. But but the you know the unbeliever's response is to ignore or to defy. Uh, but for the Christian, it's a two-way relationship in which we receive from God and we return uh, faith and, and love and gratitude to God. So there's this, and that's that's really how we have experienced human relationships. We, you know, we, we have all kinds of relationships, but in a sense, the closer the relationship, the more there is that two-way, to and fro, giving and receiving. And uh, But the other thing about communion, the other I think thing that's really helpful about communion, and I think this helps... Uh, is um, is I I I mean it's a it's a distinction that I've stolen from the um, English Puritan John Owen between union and communion, and I think in one sense that's a little bit arbitrary, but it's a really helpful th- to say that there are these two types of uh, ways in which our relationship with God takes place. And his point is that union is a one way; it's all God's initiative; it's all down to God that we have this union with God in Christ that is not affected by what. I have done or might do it's all grounded in his grace and that creates this great foundation for life and then communion is the two-way relationship uh, in which we actually there is giving and receiving and and in that sense in that in in my communion then is affected by what I do or don't do Uh, so the more that I spend time with God the more I read his word the more I respond in faith to the circumstances of my life the more I look for and see him involved in 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 my day-to-day existence then the more I enjoy that communion with God and I think that's a really helpful distinction because it guards the grace of our relationship that relationship is built on grace that's union it means that even if I mess up my relationship if and I think do things if I sin against God, if I defy, you know, defy Him, or uh, I don't respond well to His love in those situations, I can always, as it were, as a Christian, I can always kind of fall back on that union. I've always got that foundation. At the same time, it captures what I think we do experience, which is when we invest in our relationship with God, we enjoy Him more. That is the reality, and I think sometimes we're wary of saying that because we don't want to compromise grace. We don't want to kind of imply that somehow our relationship with God is based on what we do. Uh, it's in based in you know it, it it rests on the father's love the son's work and the spirit's work in us but but the union communion distinction i think helps us get that sorted out so that we can really uh, call one another to invest in our relationship with god with an expectation that that makes a difference and yet at the same time have this great foundation of god's grace in our lives i thought it was one of the best things about the book that you managed to talk about what it means for us to respond to god and to do things, to invest, as you say, uh, in that two-way communion, um, while avoiding totally any idea that somehow we're trying to get ourselves closer to God or or that we're working our way up um, by our own efforts to... um, to salvation or to or that it's a matter of certain techniques or mystical experience that we... um, In other words, you very helpfully anchored the whole thing in the fact that God has done everything yeah. um, and, and that he's given himself totally to us in Christ uh, and that it's all been achieved, but that in this two-way relationship, we come to appreciate and understand and actualize in our experience and enjoy in our experience that a relationship that he's established more and more and more. Yeah. Um, have I got you right? Is that what Yeah, you're absolutely. Doing? That's absolutely it. And I think that's a brilliant idea. But, you know, I, I did... I did steal it from John Owen, you know, so, so it's, I'm happy to commend that as a great idea because, you know, it, it's, it's something I learned from him. Well, thank you for, for channeling John Owen that way. I have read Communion with God uh, several years ago, and I found it very tough going, I have to say. And it, it wasn't just the language and his, his very, to our ears, tortured yes. way of expressing himself. Um, but you, you managed to pull out the essence of it and express it in a way that, that makes sense on Monday morning, if I can put it that way. Yes, okay. Whereas I think Good. John Owen's pretty tough on Monday morning. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, you seem to be saying, you, you talked before about how uh, the key to this communion, this two-way exp- experience of that sort of relationship with God, is realising that God is Father, Son and Spirit, and not just kind of thinking of him as God, some sort of 
semi-impersonal force up yes. there, but he's three yes. persons in one God. And that appreciating those three persons is a vital aspect of getting to know God more in that sense and enjoy him more. In what way are they different? Like, how does knowing the Father or thinking about the Father or thinking about and knowing the Son and thinking about knowing the Spirit, what difference does it make to think of them as separate persons? Yes, I think this is... So here we've got a little bit of heavy-duty theology, but it cashes out in a very simple principle that I think makes it as, as a big kind of value for us so this is the idea that uh, we can't and christian theology throughout the centuries has always affirmed this that we cannot know the essence of god the oneness of god the 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 being of god because it's beyond our comprehension in fact it's not even that it's sort of a bit complicated for us to get our heads around we we have no uh we have nothing in our experience that, that allows us to kind of connect it and say, well, it's a bit like that, or it, it's something that's completely beyond our comprehension. We have no analogues in our in our world to kind of connect us to it. And uh, and in fact, in some Christian theologians, that's almost led them to despair. But, the, but, but the, the great news is we can relate to the persons of God. So we can't relate to the essence of God, the oneness of God, or the godness of God, if I can put it like that. Uh, but we can relate to the persons of God, because God is himself a relational, relating being. Uh, he has eternally, it, it, he does eternally exist as three persons who are living in a loving, uh, joyful relationship with one another. And, uh, and therefore, he is able to relate to us on that same basis. And so we can relate, we can know uh, the, uh, the persons of God. And so then the kind of, as you say, the cash value of that is that our relationship with God, and I think people, if people are trying to think about relating to God as a kind of generic being, it's just difficult to to, to conceptualize or to think about what that might involve. And um, But we can relate to God the Father, relate to God the Son, relate to God the Spirit. So in a sense, the principle boils down very simply to how is the Father relating to me? How is the Son relating to me? How is the Spirit relating to me? And in each case, how can I respond? By the way, it's important, having said all that, that you don't then sort of separate them out because the, they are one being. And uh, if you start to, and this is where, you know, you're kind of doing this backwards and forwards, as you think about the three, you always think about the one and, and in reverse because it's really important that to encounter one member of the Trinity is to encounter all three. And so, and you know, one of the complications of writing the book is you're, 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 you're having this chapter on the Father, but you can't do that without talking about the Son and the Spirit and vice versa. And there are a number of points that you could think, well, I could put that in here, or I could put it over there, because you're always engaging with the three together, because they are one God, they are one being. You talk about relating to God, for example, as Father, yeah. and talking to him as my Father, rather yes. than just a generic father or an absent or a distant father. Um, and at relating to God in that way in the midst of particular experiences. Can you give an example of, of how relating to God as my father or our father in a particular experience of life can help us to enjoy that relationship more? I think, what, so one of the things I say, talk about, is that we live in a fathered world. So this is just kind of uh, riffing off Jesus teaching in the Sermon on the Mount that uh, where he calls on us, in fact he uses the word children, to uh, to trust in God's care of us. So we don't need to worry because God is caring for us. And to prove that point, he points to the uh, the flowers who are kind of clothed and the birds who are cared for. In other words, what he's saying is look around you and you see a fathered world, a world in which God the Father is caring for all, all his creatures. And then of course how much more then does he care for those who are his children? And so we can receive this world as a gift from him. And uh, one of the ways I love to do that is not just to say that, well, okay, then God's going to kind of look after me, but actually all that I am receiving, all that I am enjoying in this life, uh, all that I see around me is a gift from God the Father, and I'm, I can receive it as a gift from him. And... Um, so, for example, and this is very sort of personal to me, I love uh, watching birds. I love, you know, I love walking and I love looking at the birds and identifying the birds that I see. Okay? I mean, I realize it's a sort of slightly peculiar uh, thing, but there we are. It's what I love to do. And, and I have a sense, I really do genuinely have a very strong sense that when I see a particular bird that gives me pleasure, 
that is a gift from my heavenly father you know it could have flown it the other way when i wasn't looking or i could have been distracted or you know there's just a hundred different things that could have but there it is and it's there for me to see and uh, there's been many times when i felt that as a very precious gift actually um that you know it's, it's it, these things cheer me the bird song has an effect on me that I, it's very hard i was trying i'm trying to analyze i can't work out how it works but but it has such a sort of uh, a soul lifting effect on me and i see that but here's the point i see that as a gift from my father uh that that he he sends in my direction as it were he's built it into the fabric of the universe that he's made and then he sends particular examples instances of that as a gift for me for me to enjoy to lift my heart and so this sort of and and then the thing about that is then that 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 attitude that act that way of seeing the world then means that all that pleasure is directed back it leads me to the father in that situation and actually uh, is you know to receive it as a gift from him and return great gratitude to him is a relational act that means I'm enjoying God in that moment. I'm not just enjoying the bird song. I'm enjoying God in that moment. I hope you're enjoying this conversation with Tim Chester as much as I did and there's more good stuff to come but first I just wanted to pause and encourage you to go out and buy Tim's book and to give you the details for that it's called enjoying God experience the power and love of God in everyday life it's published by good book company and it's available from your local Christian bookseller I checked on Kurong and reformers bookshop and the wandering bookseller they're all advertising it for $14.99 which seems to me ridiculously good value and it will be available soon it's only just been released uh, and sometime in the first week or two of December it will come in and of course, while you're online and ordering books, you could also grab a copy of an excellent anthology of articles that's available uh, from three decades of writing about the Christian life. It's an anthology that would make excellent holiday reading and, of course, a great gift to inflict upon a loved one. I'm talking, of course, about the Tony Payne collection, and it's available also at every good Christian bookseller and over at Matthias Media as well. Not to say that Matthias Media isn't a good Christian. Oh, never mind. But today's podcast is about Tim Chester's book, isn't it? Not mine. So let's get back to that, to the interview and back to the question of birdsong. What I like about that example and illustration, and you, you take the same approach repeatedly in different ways throughout the book, is that you're really saying that what's happening there is that in that circumstance you're understanding that circumstance in a way that is driven by faith, by an understanding of what's really going on. In yes. other words, a bird comes, you look at it, it's a bird, what a nice bird, I enjoy that bird. But but with the eyes of faith, as it were, that is yeah. based on our understanding of what reality is really like, what's, re what's really going on here is that my heavenly father has created and sent this bird, a beautiful bird, and has given me the ability to appreciate and enjoy it it's it's a reorienting of of our understanding by faith to what's to the circumstances that are really happening and and you repeatedly do this in the book and it's one of the things i appreciated most about yes. it that you often say think about it like this yes. or say to yourself instead of saying this to yourself say this to yourself yes. um, to what extent is that really the one of the underlying drives of the book that coming to know God more, coming to enjoy him more, is really a matter of coming to understand more deeply in faith the way things really are, what God is really doing in, in each circumstance. Yes, and I think, I mean, a couple of comments there. I think absolutely yes, it is about allowing Scripture to to train us to 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 see the world, to see our life, to see the circumstances of our life as interactions from God. Um, so it's not that I'm sort of trying, I, I hope I'm not being sort of fanciful in this, it's allowing scripture to train us to see the world in a particular kind of way and therefore to see it as, uh, or to see how the Father, Son and Spirit are involved in our lives. And that's the second thing I want to highlight really, which is that one of the things I want to stress quite strongly in the book is, I think when we think about enjoying God or having a relationship with God, very often in, in the modern 
church, that kind of comes down to having this rather sort of gushy feeling when I'm worshipping. Um, you know, when the key change, when there's the key change in the song, there's the modulation. Here we yeah, go. Yeah, here we go. And then we all now we all feel something. Um, I, I don't mean to. I don't mean to be dismissive of that. That because we do encounter. You know, there is that emotional response to God that to is limit me- it to that. that is mediated yeah. through the music, yes. which is his is gaff. Yes. So there's that. that and then the other thing is the sort of um, hearing some kind of sensing some kind of word or message from God. That's the other sort of thing that often people think of when they think of having a relationship with God. And what I'm trying to do is actually to say, God is involved in our lives all over the place. You know, every 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 moment, every situation, God is interacting actively, personally. Uh, this The triune God of all the universe is personally engaging with me in all the moments and all the stuff of my life. And if we've got the eyes to see it, then that's a, an amazing thing. And that's why then we have this the potential, this reality of of having a relationship with God, of enjoying God in all the stuff of life, and not just limiting it to those particular kind of examples. Another example is I talk about um, how in how, how as we groan uh, that that actually is an interaction that we have with God. So uh, all human beings groan. I mean, my um, I don't think I put this in the book, but anyway, but my father-in-law is sort of exemplar of this. He's uh, he's reached an age where he you know he can't do anything without a, a sort of audible noise coming out. And um, but you know it's it's happening to us all. It happens to me. I can I I groan if I get out of a sort of a, if I'm you know if I'm in a an armchair and I get up, then there's a sort of little groan that comes out. And but the point I want to make is that. That uh, f- so everybody does that because I think there's that sense. I mean, in some in some sense, that's a sort of um, uh, instinctive sort of a react, uh, um, uh, unarticulated uh, reaction. But uh, you know, people groan and moan about life because. But but that arises in all human beings because there's this recognition that life is not as it should be, not as it was, not it was not as it was meant to be. Uh, but. In Romans 8, Paul talks about how we groan and the Spirit groans with us uh, because we have the Spirit who is the first fruits of a new creation. So the difference for the Christian is that those moments of groaning are a reminder that this world is not what it will be. So it's not just not what it was, but not what it will be. And so if we have, if we train our minds, as it were, if we tell ourselves, if we remind ourselves of that reality, uh, that the Spirit is is given to us as the first fruits of a new creation so that those groans then become actually a pointer forward uh, a kind of reinforcement of the hope that we have of a of a new world with new bodies where perhaps there won't be quite so much groaning uh, and aching going on in our in a redeemed body it's a great example uh, of of an experience we all have which can be hard which can feel anything but uh, like a a joyful yes, and of course, getting out of a chair is a sort of is a sort of rather sort of um, light-hearted. Uh, but, but but you know, the groaning can be actually very deep and very painful when we're talking about bereavement or uh, disappointment or I mean or, or uh, chronic illness. Or, you know, so so I'm I'm using that as a sort of simple way of talking about it. But yes, you're right; it can be actually a very profound, uh, painful experience that we're actually talking about here. But with uh, an understanding of what really is happening in that experience, what that experience represents, what God is doing and how God is interacting with us in that experience and what it points forward to. In other words, with a different moral imagination, with a different spiritual imagination of what is really happening here, it changes our interaction with God it ch- and it changes how we experience and feel yeah. in that circumstance. Yes, yeah, so that's one point in the book where I talk about... I. I I don't know whether this is uh, whether you in did, in Australia did you get the observer books growing up? I did. Yeah. Yes, okay. uh, but well, I, I think I it's did, generational. It probably though. was generational. So the obs- I, I had the observer book of aircraft. Yeah, well, I had the observer book of birds, as you might as you might have guessed. So, um, uh, we, you know, there, there were these little pocket-sized books that that just gave a list. They were just lists, really, uh, sort of one page with. Uh, with with a bird and a little a picture and then uh, and they were there to kind of uh, encourage young people in that sort of slightly patronizing 1950s kind of 1960s kind of way to see the world and to observe it and uh, learn a little bit more about it and uh, i think really so partly what i'm trying to do in this book is to create an observer's book of god um in other words to 
to give people, a, to train people, to encourage people to see all the ways that we can see God at work in our lives. Uh, and just to have, have really have the eyes to see that, the imagination to see that. Yes, so your chapter titles have that character. So they work through the different experiences of life. So in every hardship, there's the one we were talking about. In every hardship, we can enjoy the Father's formation. In every prayer, we can enjoy the Father's welcome. We've already talked about in every pleasure, the pleasure of perhaps the bird song, we, we can enjoy the Father's generosity. Uh, I thought it was very effective that those chapter titles captured a regular experience of life. Yes, part of what I'm trying to do there is is to lead with our experience, and then to sh- even we, even in the way the titles of uh, uh, the chapter titles are formed is to start with our experience experiences that I hope you know you look down the contents list and you say oh yes I I feel hardship I feel pleasure I groan uh, and uh, and then con- and then sort of then it sort of draw the line there into how the different members of the Trinity are interacting with us in that in that moment in that process. Final question then, what difference has writing the book made to your own enjoyment of God? Yes, good question. So one of the things that drove the book was a recognition a few years ago that I, uh, in my own experience, that I had a very, I had a very kind of real sense of relating to the Father because I pray to him and I have a very strong sense that all the circumstances of my life are sent by him, good and bad, uh, those good, good and bad experiences to form me into the image of his son. Very strong sense of relating to the Holy Spirit, uh, not in the sense of having sort of tingles down the spine, but just a, a very keen awareness that the good things that I do uh, are done through him and in his strength. They're certainly not sort of down to me, as it were. Uh, but the Lord Jesus Christ felt quite distant to me. Uh, I. Uh, I mean, I completely get that his cross and resurrection is the absolute foundation of the Christian life. And, but that in uh, itself is distant. But that's 2,000 years ago. It's a long time ago. And now he's ascended into heaven, and that's a long, way, a long away. way away. And so uh, he felt somewhat distant to me. And intuitively, I felt that couldn't be right. And uh, one of the things that sort of sparked then was asking other people what their experience was. And that was fascinating in itself. Fascinating partly because everybody gives a different answer. Uh, But also, it's a great way of having a conversation with people about what it actually feels like for them to be a Christian um, and what that what that actually uh, looks like in their own experience in their own life. So it's a great way of having very interesting and and, and, uh, profitable conversations with people. I commend it as a as a question to throw into your dinner party or whatever. Um, But then I started to so then that caused me then to think about, well, actually, because I think, I mean, the conviction is that we ought to be relating to all three. And that's sort of the healthy, or I I don't want people to get sort of beat up about, oh, I need to get these things in balance or something. But to be pursuing all three is to be heading in the direction of a healthy, rounded relationship with God. And so one of the key things for me is just to be able to, to have filled out for me how I'm relating to the Lord Jesus Christ and for that to have real substance. And uh, that has led me to a much greater appreciation of, of not just his work, but, but his person. I think that would be the way I'd sum it up. So, you know, I've always had this strong sense of, uh, of the work of Christ and the, uh, you know, the atoning uh, work of the cross and the uh, resurrection as this promise of a new age and so on. But actually the person of Christ and, uh, and to be living in relationship with him, that's where it's had an impact on me. my thanks to Tim Chester for joining us today on the Centre for Christian Living podcast. Thank you also for being with us. And as always, we'd love to hear your feedback. Any questions you have about this podcast or about any facet of the Christian life, just get in touch. Send us an email. You can contact us at ccl at more.edu.au. Head over to our website at ccl.more.edu.au for all the back issues of this podcast, the archive of all the different uh, episodes, lots of other articles and excellent resources about the Christian life, and of course to find details and to register for our first event for 2019, that's on February the 27th on the elusive joy of Christian community. Thanks again for being with us uh, for this episode. I'm Tony Payne. 
Bye for now.